yeah, it goes by so quickly. And, and I'm, I'm fortunate. Like I, I want to see other places. I want to play for, for different teams. And, and as long as you're contending, right. And you want to be one yeah. of the teams that can, that can hopefully. Well, win. you're going somewhere. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're not going to the fucking Kraken, baby. <laughs> you're going to the Canes. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited. I'm really excited. When I stepped on the ice, I never backed down and I never stayed down. And I was vicious, and I was malicious, and I don't care. I'm alive. He's a freaking madman. Look at him going to town. That'll be a suspension. That'll be a fine. Alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. Welcome to the show. Awesome uh, that you joined Tim and I today. I appreciate it. Um, God, uh, <laughs> I've followed you. From day one, your career, obviously, um, growing up in Connecticut, me moving back to Montreal, uh, kind of coincided with your time there. Um, let's go back to Connecticut just quick, if we can, growing up there. What was that like as far as you growing up in organized hockey there? It's funny you say that because, or ask that, because hockey in Connecticut growing up was pretty poor and, 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 uh, we didn't have many teams. Uh, it just so happened that a bunch of the kids from our team, we had really good coaching, a guy by the name of Mike Backman, who's actually uh, Jonathan Quick's father-in-law, Matt Molson's father-in-law. He coached a bunch of the local teams. And uh, his son wasn't even our age, but he coached our team as well. And I think it turned into this hockey hotbed where, you know, uh, Jonathan Quick, uh, Kevin Shanker, Cam Atkinson, a bunch of the guys on the team, uh, ended up making it and and then I go back now and I see what youth hockey is like now that I have kids of my own and it's just you know first rounders every year are coming out of there and they just won the brick tournament for the third year in a row which is the 10 U like best tournament in the world for for youth hockey so um I, I believe it all started with that coach Mike Backman but it's it's amazing how it's evolved into the hockey hotbed that it is right now and and it makes sense that it turned that way. I, I think hockey wasn't popular then um, until about 94. I think that's when the Rangers won the cup. That's when I put on skates uh, for the first time after watching, you know, Messier guarantee the, the win and, and lift the cup at the garden. And that's the reason why I played hockey is watching that series and, and that season. And I think that's kind of what kickstarted, I guess, uh, the movement of youth hockey in Connecticut and the whole New York area. Well, it's funny you say that because me growing up in Boston and back in the day when I was a kid, you know, it was Boston and Minnesota. Those are the two yeah. places you played hockey in the U.S. And then it started to spread, obviously, the NHL running grassroots programs. And, and like you said, the Rangers won the cup. That was a big thing. And I think, obviously, Backman, I played against him. I know him, Mike Backman. And um, it's funny because you said Backman had such a big part in that. But I think Jerry Dwyer would fucking yeah. be pissed if he heard you saying that <laughs> right now. He'd be like, you shit me. It wasn't Backman. It was me. It was Jerry Dwyer <laughs> responsible. But no, and Jerry, honestly, um, Jerry and I went to college together, played together. He coached uh, Max some when he was a kid. And Jerry told me all about, and it is amazing when, Hockey starts in Connecticut like that. And the kids you play were growing up. I mean, they all, not all of them made the NHL, but right. Atkinson, Quick, uh, yourself. Who else? Who was the, the other one? Sh uh, on Shattenkirk. Shattenkirk. Ben Smith, Mark Arcabello. Yeah. Yeah. I like to have There's six where's kids. Ryan who, Shannon, where's like Ryan Shannon from? Well, yeah. So I shouldn't leave Ryan Shannon. He was the wave before us. He was like the only one. Really, that made it before anybody. I think he might be an 83, so I think he's four or five years older than me. Um, yeah, I shouldn't disrespect him because he was the first <laughs> one to really make it, but he kind of made it on his own without that, uh, I guess, hotbed mentality of, of, you know, a bunch of us are going to make it. So he's actually coaching my, my old high school right now. So he's in the area trying to build up the hockey there as well. And now before you, though, in your family, like, no, like, are you the first to play? Because, like, your, mo your mom's from Mexico, yeah. right? Yeah, my mom, in, like, yeah, born in Mexico. Uh, my dad from California, uh, San Fran area. They just 
packed up one day, moved out east, said we're, we're sick of uh, the West Coast. They went to Manhattan. Once they had kids, they moved to Connecticut. And uh, like I said, when the Rangers won the cup, me and my dad went oh. uh, to the local rink, went free skating, um, and the rest was history. I think once I was able to beat him in a race around the rink, that's when he signed me up for hockey. And then uh, we just kind of fell in love with the game together. So that uh, hockey hotbed of Connecticut, you end up going, I went the prep school route. I went to Northwood school. I looked at going to Taft. You went to Taft. Um, how was that experience at Taft? And, and listen, uh, hockey being the main one, but you had to play three sports there. What were those three sports? Yeah. I'm embarrassed to admit that uh, <laughs> I, managed, I managed the field hockey team in the fall. <laughs> I uh, did hockey in the winter, obviously, and then I, it was really good. Our coach made us do track in the spring, so we ran the 400 and the 800, which was pretty cool. So, yeah, yeah. prep school is awesome experience, <laughs> and you go there. Then you play a year in uh, Sioux City and off to the University of Michigan. Why did you go west, young man, instead of staying in the east? Because I'm sure BU, BC, all them schools probably want you, right? No one wanted me. I was Really? Uh, when I committed, I... Yeah, I, I was really small. I was in, in my uh, junior year. I think I grew like six inches and like gained like 50 pounds. And I'd been talking to actually division three schools before then, but I had a family advisor at that time. And he was like, you know, I got a really good connection with Michigan. I could probably get you there on a half scholarship. So uh, he held his word. I, I got that half scholarship. I shot up like a beanstalk. I went to, the, to Sioux City that next year, went in the first round and they ended up turning that uh, half scholarship into a full scholarship. And uh, yeah, it was kind of cool how it evolved. I was such a late bloomer, but I, I did go on a visit to BC. I never got offered anything. Uh, same thing with, uh, I think, Vermont, Harvard, and Dartmouth. Um, but at the end of the day, the only school that really offered me at the time was Michigan. And, and wow, I was really I didn't thankful know that. for that. Yeah. Did you have intentions just to go? You went one year. I mean, I, at school had to be fun, right? Like, do you go to any of the big house football games and all that? Yeah, I'm, it was the best place <laughs> on earth. My sister ended up going after me because she just liked coming out visiting so much. The reason, the, I, I think the main reason why I left was uh, my, both my line mates had signed. They, they were seniors, Kevin Porter and Chad Cleric. And I think deep down there was a part of me that, that worried about I don't want to say sophomore slump, but, you know, like if my line mates were leaving, would things be completely different? Would I maybe regress a little bit? And, and you know, my first three, year pro, three years pro really weren't easy. I was up and down uh, often. And, and there were times where I doubted uh, the decision to leave. But at the end of the day, it worked out. Yeah, that's certainly yeah, probably when you make that decision to leave college is the big thing. I know. I wanted to leave after my second year. My father was all over me. No way you're leaving. You're staying, blah, blah, blah. I stay one more year, and I missed that Stanley Cup, the fourth in a row. I probably oh, yeah. would have been there for it. But that being said, you do leave. You make that move to leave, and, and you come to Montreal, um, go to camp, drafted in the first round, 22nd overall. What? To tell the people the story of you – well, you score a goal in your first game, first shot on net, you yeah. score a goal. Tell the people the story of you on the bench, not playing, and act actually asking, if you're not going to play, please send me down to Hamilton. Not many people do that. Yeah. I, you know what? I was, I was so naive. Uh, and I think almost in a good way. I just figured I'm going to be an NHL player. I'm going to be a top six player. Um you know, I had an unbelievable camp my first year and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to make this team. And I, I was so dumb. Like they, they had this roster is completely set in stone. There was no room for me. So I ended up going down. I'm upset about it. I don't know why, because I should have known right from the beginning that there's no room for me, but I went down to Hamilton, probably didn't have the best attitude, felt like I deserved to go up, eventually got called up and, uh, I got called up for one day. They said, don't even come to the rink. Uh, and then they sent me down that night. I was so mad. And then I came up, uh, I think a couple of weeks later, scored my first goal, thinking, you know, I'm on a line here with Alex Kovalov. I'm never <laughs> going to play in the minors again. You know, life, this is easy. And uh, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> I just, I think I went a long time without scoring. I, I, we changed coaches. We changed, uh, after that year, we changed management. I was just like uh, going up and down. But I kind of still had that like naive cockiness of, no, no, like my time's going to come. Like, I don't know 
why it's taking so long, but I'm going to be an NHL player. This is what I'm going to do. And I just never really thought otherwise. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned, I just sitting on the bench playing so little felt my confidence was fading. And, uh, I did like an interview and it was, you know, I think my phone woke me up before that interview. And I was just, <laughs> I was just <laughs> honest about everything. And I had been telling people so much, like, if I'm not going to play, I might as well just go down. And it's not about the money right now. It's about, you know, becoming the hockey player that I want to be. And, and, I told them that I got sent down and I just, me and uh, my buddy, Davey Darnay just absolutely lit it up. I mean, we didn't have a care in the world. We were just go down there, play for an unbelievable coach, Randy Cunnyworth. He just kind of let us do our thing, play offense, have fun. That's what we did. And, and eventually we're having so much fun. I lit it up one game. I didn't even know the GM was there. And I guess he was waiting for me uh, after the game. And what GM was that, Max? Which, that was Pierre, Go, Pierre Gauthier. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, lit it up that game, just go home, you know, have a nice dinner. I look at my phone. I've got like 10 missed calls from the coaches, the GM, everyone. And the GM calls me and he's like, hey, I was looking for you after the game. And I got to ask you, like, do you even want to go up? And I was like, I mean, I don't know. Am I going to play? And he's like, well, I, I just can't have you down here anymore. Uh like pack up your apartment. You're, you're going up for good. <laughs> I was like, like looking back on it, it was so risky and so naive. And I guess uh, I was pretty cocky about all that, but really it was the right decision to go down there. So I, I'm not mad with how it played out, but you know, I don't know if I'd have the, uh, the nuts to do that <laughs> today. And, and yeah, so we stand here today and that's what happened, but there were times where I really doubted myself and I'm sure people don't, don't see that side of it. The my it's fun though. I I think you're I think that experience. I mean, I don't have the career you had, but I played against you a lot when I was in the Marlies. I remember you fighting Daryl Boyce, yeah. so I knew like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I was guy that got called up here and there. But I remember a couple of times I was having so much fun, I get called up, and I'd be like, "Fucking, maybe call someone else up." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you're so comfortable. But no, I remember you down there, and and you definitely were doing whatever it took to get back up there, or whatever you're doing. But um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we yeah. Uh, some of those Marley's Bulldogs battles <laughs> yeah. were, you know, three and three, and yeah, yeah. like our fighters <laughs> would fight three days in a row, and they'd come to the game with their nose <laughs> touching their earlobe. It was just like, I, like I, we uh, said, we were so naive, like, oh, this is so much fun, but you get your all your teeth knocked out with one, you know, swing of the stick, and you're just like. <laughs> There's a long way from New England <laughs> prep school, but it, it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun down there. Yeah, listen, it, there's no question. Uh, and I think back to my days coming in, talk about na naive. I didn't have a clue about pro hockey and how it ran, the way things worked. You know, when I came in, Max, they, they didn't like Americans. You were a yeah. kid. You, you were a fucking college kid yeah. is what you were. You are a fucking college kid. You know, they thought, oh, if college kids on top, this and that. And then certainly uh, I changed that fucking perception pretty quick. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at that and, and so you, you make the big team and, and you're up in Montreal now and that adjustment, a lot of people talk about the organization. It's great, but you got to deal with the media. You got to deal with the French media and the English media and all the bullshit that goes along with it. That I absolutely love playing there. I love the fan base. The electricity in that building is unbelievable. Looking at that, how was that? The, the beginning, I guess, and, and your time there was fun for you. You, had a, you fucking had a successful time in Montreal, no question about it. What were some of the drawbacks, though? If you're, you're telling someone they're going to Montreal, what are you telling them? Say, hey, watch out for this. Yeah, you know, there's so much turnover. It was like players, uh, coaches, staff, um, you know, GMs. I, I just had so my first couple of years, I had like three GMs and three coaches. That, and it seemed like every year you're getting a new fourth line and then you're trading a couple of guys here and there. And not to say that that's a bad thing, but it was like really hard for me to come from college where you're just like, you're a family, right? Like you can't trade a guy in college. Like this is our team. Yeah. This is set in stone. And you know, you'll block a shot for the guy next to you and he'll block it for you. And then you get to the pros. 
And you're like, well, you know, that guy might eat a puck and then I could get a couple more minutes every now and then. And <laughs> that, that for me was the biggest adjustment. And that's not geared towards Montreal. I think maybe a little bit of like the turnover was with the, you know, you get to know a coach and then the next year he gets fired. And, and uh, you know, it just, I think when I look back on my time in Montreal, I think if you handle the negatives and kind of turn them into a positive, you're going to be better off in your career for it. I mean, you always have someone holding you accountable. You play bad that game, fans let you have it, media lets you have it. You go back to your house at night, you just turn on any channel and they're talking about you. <laughs> and and so many people view it as a negative. And, and they're, listen, it, it's easy to do so. There are times when you're sitting there like, geez, can you just lay off me? And it's like, at the end of the day, though, like if you handle that the right way, if, if you say, you know, I, I, I got to have a good game tomorrow, I no matter what, I, I, I got to do what's right to have a good game tomorrow. And I found myself in that position a lot. Maybe my wife wasn't too uh, happy with how pleasant I was when I was, you know, getting some of the heat because I was just so dialed in. Like, you know, I, I could get traded if I go a couple more games here without scoring a goal or, or they're really going to come down on me. But I seem to always have found a way to dig myself out of that by, you know, really bearing down and making sure that, you know, I, I, had that good game or I scored that big goal up, up until my last year where I had, um, it was a really tough year for, for our team, for our organization, for everybody. And, and I, I was really proud of everything that I accomplished there in terms of that, except for my last year, it got away from me. But I, you know, I watched last night that documentary about uh, Patrick Waugh and Claude Lemieux and, and it was no different from him. I, I felt like I, he was talking to me through the TV screen about, you know, what happened. And, and it seems like a lot of people, most players that have been there for a long time kind of go through that. And, and at the end of the day, you can be a better player because of it. If you just, you know, tackle it and handle it the right way. But that's the pressure that you talk about playing in Montreal. A lot, a lot of people say, Oh, what pressure, you know, the pressure, yeah. well, the pressure of being held accountable at every turn and that pressure, it, how you deal with it and looking at the way you dealt with it. Come on, six times scored 30 goals. I mean, who does that there in this day and age? So you certainly looking back on it, dealt with it good. And I look at when you talk about being naive to what pro hockey was at the beginning, can't help but blame you. I was naive. I know when I started, but when you talk about the tumultuous start, when, you know, Bob Ganey, then Gauthier, and then Bergevin, uh, this coach, that coach. It, it, that is not a great way to start. It's, you need that stability and certainly battling through that and then doing what you did as far as scoring goals. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and you did prove it. And I think fans always wanted more because you're a big guy. Everybody thought you should be more physical, this and that. That is not your, your, your game. Is you, You're that power forward, drive that puck, drive the net, get that quick shot away, all those things. I think people weren't at times happy with that. They thought there should have been more there. When you weren't scoring, well, do some, they wanted you to do something else. And, and I think that was unfair. There were even times I thought that way, Max. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was, looking back, unfair in that sense, because that wasn't your game. That isn't your game. And you certainly stepped up to the plate when called upon it. Every scorer goes through that shit. They go through their difficult times where they're slumping. But a lot of them don't have to deal with what you have to deal with in Montreal when when it comes to that. Yeah, I, I always thought that was so funny. It's like people think I'm so much bigger than I am. I'm I'm six <laughs> one. <laughs> Everyone thinks I'm like six six. I should be bashing guys' heads through the glass. I'm like, no, like you go try and hit ten people and then try and you know skate wide around. It's just impossible to play that way, especially eighty two games, yeah. especially fifteen years, especially you know maintain that and stay injury free. It's funny because uh, Pete DeBoer, probably the best coach I had to date in terms of like getting the best out of me and. He's like, I always notice, like, I look at the score sheet when you have a bad first period or bad first couple of shifts and you have like five, six hits. Like, we don't we don't need you just running around like an idiot. Like, your job is to score goals and create offense. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's so relieving to hear, like, 
I just, it's so ingrained in me that it's like, okay, if you're not scoring, you got to make a name for yourself, go run someone. And listen, there is a time and place for that, especially in the playoffs, but it's like, don't run yourself out of position when your job is to create offense. I mean, it's like I said, there's so, it's so hard to do all that at once. And at the end of the day, I'm scored to, I'm paid to score goals and create offense. I'm I'm not getting any more money. I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not going to go into uh, free agency and they're going to be like, well, you had this many hits. I mean, I get it. It is a nice little bonus and icing on the cake to, to, to play physical. And there are times where I should add it more and sometimes where I should scale it back. But I look back at my days just like you in, in Montreal and it was just like constantly like, Oh, why aren't yep. you just crushing everyone and this and that? And, hey, I stay true to myself and I made a nice little career out of, uh, out of what I do best. And Hey, no player is perfect. You can find something on every player in the league that they can do better. Yep. And, and if, if it's at times me being a little bit more physical, yeah, definitely. But there are times where I where I am very physical, and and you know, like I said, Pete DeBoer didn't think that was the best for me. How was DeBoer as a coach? He's very, he's a very good coach. He's uh, systematically, I, I, there's, I don't think there's anyone in the league like him. I mean, you knew exactly where to be at all areas of the ice. Um, our D zone structure was flawless. Everyone would just the second he came in, you just there was no confusion. You knew exactly where to be at all times, and that's why. You know, minus last year, he gets you right there. He gives you an opportunity to win it all uh, because of that structure. So, Maxie, um, yeah, the Montreal time, and we got to talk about this. And it, we look at uh, Bergevin comes in, and um, you know, he has a new GM. Never, you know, yeah, he was in Chicago. He's a scout, advanced scout, assistant GM. Did held all them jobs and learned, kind of learned the ropes. And then he gets an opportunity in Montreal, comes in. Um, what was it like when he came in the first time around? Because, boy, I got this feeling um, with Berg. He's obviously a, a, an emotional guy, but a guy that um, he really wanted to protect the players that were there. I often felt that he wanted to keep you guys from – so much from having to live up to the tradition and the past of that organization. This is the feeling I got. He didn't want any of the older guys. And it's not that I had to be there or Guy Lafleur had to be there or this one had to be there, but that was something that organization always prided themselves on. When I was coming up there, I saw Dickie Moore, Jean Beliveau, all of them, the, the Rocket Rashad, Henry Rashad, they'd always come in the room and talk to the guys, and it, it was awesome. It was awesome. That that went away. And I always got the feeling that Bergman was so, you know, worried about players having to live up to that, that he's kind of tried to protect his team. Any truth to that? I've never, I've never thought of it that way. I think that makes sense. He's, uh, when Burge first came in, I think it was his passion that everyone was kind of drawn towards. Like, uh, he was a fiery guy. Um, would get, like you said, really emotional. You've seen him cry a bunch of times. You see him fired up a bunch of times. Um, I didn't know anything other than what my time was there because I think before he came, I was too young to even really have a relationship with any of the ex-players um, other than yourself. And and uh, even if he did feel that way, it, it, it didn't stop me. I have, I've always had a really good relationship with all the alumni. I mean, uh, I remember a couple of times Guy Lafleur came out publicly about me, but then after that, I mean, uh, up till the end, him and I, I would text him often. Uh, he was like uh, a guy that I talked to a lot about stuff, uh, golf tournaments. I started living there in the summer. I started to get know, get to know you guys a little bit more. I uh, spent some time with Serge Savard. I, if he felt that way, it didn't stop me at all from, from having relationships with you guys. And I learned just so much from, uh, I guess the experiences that the, that the alumni had in the past. And I know it was a uh, different league. I know, I'll, you know, it's a different sport now. It's a lot more, I guess, uh, individual and guys are getting paid more. So, you know, you're going to have your, your own routines, your personal trainers, your chefs, this and that. But at the end of the day, you look at the teams that win and you look when they pick up the cup, uh, they have that camaraderie that all your teams had back in Montreal. And, and that was the number one thing that I learned. You guys are 
are brothers for life. And uh, that's the big reason why I'm chasing this ultimate goal is because I want to have that special feeling and that bond for life. I'm just, I, I, you know, the only question I had going back, I guess, not to go back, but like that pressure in Montreal, like when you became a captain, like did that amplify that too? I mean, was there, was it like, how did that feel like right away? Or like, did you feel like the pressure of the media was like even amplified more? Did you kind of, were there times where you're like, shit, this sucks being the captain? Not that you're going to say <laughs> that, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, did that just kind of make it worse? Big responsibility. Yeah, you know, right? people, yeah, I've heard people mention that to me and like, oh, you couldn't deal with being captain. And and no, I've, I've always been a person that like thrive. And like I said, what we talked about being in the past that thrives under like being held accountable. And, and, you know, I was always often my best version of myself when my dad was hard on me. So I, no, no, I, when I was a captain, I just took it so ser- I, I took it so seriously. I not to say that I didn't before, but I was just on a whole nother level of I have to do this the right way. I have to make sure that I'm ready for tomorrow because I've had a couple bad games and they'll really come down on me. I, I just amplified everything to a whole nother level. And whether that, you know, away from the rink, um, you know, that could have shown to people around me that I was, you know, under that scrutiny and. And maybe I was a little bit on edge a little bit, but when it came to being on the ice, I just, uh, I, I would do whatever it take, uh, whatever it took to, uh, kind of get the best out of myself in that situation. And the one thing that I'm really proud of is I always stood in front of those cameras and always held myself accountable, whether it's deserved or not. And, and oftentimes I'd come home and my wife would be like, why are you just throwing yourself under the bus? And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I, I got to stop doing that. But at the same time, I'm talking for 30 minutes pregame skate. I'm talking 30 minutes postgame skate. And you're catching, you know, the five seconds where I've got asked for the third time why you haven't scored three or four games. And and I see why it would come off this way. And I see why fans could see why it was a bit on edge. But what about the other, you know, 57 minutes where I was talking about how I believed in this team and and we have confidence in this room and. And that's just the way it's going to go. And it's going to go that way as long as there's, you know, 30 media members in the locker room after every skate. And, and that'll never change. But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm really proud with how I handled that. And no one can ever take that away from me. Max, and you should be. And uh, I, I think maybe some of the things you hear are, uh, and I look back at your time. And when I tell you the, the goals you scored and what you did is even more impressive now. And I'm adamant about it because when I look back, and not to throw Dave Dayane under the bus, he's a great little player, but you have never really had a bona fide number one center iceman to do that with. When you get the puck consistently from a center iceman who, who knows how to deliver that thing and has a, a good rapport with you, you never had that in Montreal. So what you did, it's even more impressive now. As far as the captaincy thing, when I look at it, explained this way is that I think some people thought that if you didn't have the burden of that, they looked at it like it was a burden to you that you having to do all that other stuff 30 minutes before the game, after the game, every fucking nut asking you every question nine times over that if you didn't have to deal with that, maybe just maybe there would have been a little less for you and you would have produced more not having to worry about that stuff. I think that's really the was a major sentiment for a lot of people that really understood the game. But that being said, when it came time, and believe me, you know, talking to people in the media, talking to other hockey people, it was really down to Max Pacioretty or P.K. Subban. And so many people just there's no way they wanted P.K., and there was a lot of people that want them, a lot of people that didn't. I get it. And it ends up going to you. And we know what happened. PK gets traded. Weber comes. Did you ever feel any pressure when Weber came to say, here you go, Shay. You're the captain now. I'm going to step aside and let you handle this. Not one bit of pressure at all. And I'll just say this. I'm, I just looked it up right now. My first year captain... <laughs> I scored 35 goals. Like, what would I bet? 37 if I didn't have more pre- Like, that's four off my career high. Like, that for me, yeah. when people would say that, I would say quite the opposite. I thought that was my best year. 
And and the one thing that I do, and I'm a little bit like you in this sense, Knuckles, is I'm a really loyal person. And people tend yeah. to forget that the the coach that kind of developed me and brought me into the NHL and, and made me the man and the person that I was and the guy that I became captain under, uh, Michelle Terrian, got fired that year. And he got fired when I think we're in first place or close to first place in the division or the, or the conference. And uh, yeah, I mean, I would say, I would argue that when people talk about um, uh, not pressure, but, you know, having a little bit of a burden, I, I just had such a great relationship with, uh, with Michelle Terry and he was, uh, and, and a guy that I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I still talk to him. I mean, I, when I yeah. go to Montreal, I've seen him often and, and he was like, he was so good for me. And, and when the change happened, being the captain of the team, obviously I wasn't involved in that. And, and, uh, it, I never really have talked about this to people, but it was a bit of a, a gut punch. Like, uh, it's like your dad, he, he reminded me so much of my dad. He was so hard on me, but in such a good way. And, and it's not to say that it didn't like Claude Julian, but I think just you're a human. And, and if you're a loyal guy like me, you're going to feel differently yeah. about, uh, showing up to the rink than the guy that kind of brought you, brought you up in that situation. So I could argue that if people saw those negatives and I would argue that I, I thought a lot of that was driven through my loyalty to, to Michelle Terrian. Um, I still don't think there's a lot of that to show, but uh, yeah, I, he's a guy that. I, why I, does he get fired then Maxi? Wait, and again, why does he get fired? Does a, a, a group of guys not liking him? He's too hot on some guys and they go in to see Bergevin and say, hey, enough of this guy. It, it could have been. And, and the thing about Montreal is, and that I really liked, is uh, players weren't involved in those decisions. And uh, that's not the case from what you hear around the NHL. Sometimes you see players getting involved and and if you're asking a player, they're going to they're going to say something for their personal self, whether they like it or not, right? whether they're admitting it or not. You know, like, oh, I don't like this yeah. guy because I play, you know, a minute less a game than than if I played uh, played for that guy. And that's just the way we are. Like, we worry we worry about ourselves. We talked about that in the beginning of the podcast. But um, in Montreal, they truly didn't, at least to myself, they didn't have me involved in any of those decisions as the captain of the team. And, and I feel in hindsight, I feel that that's the better way to do it because if you have skin in the game, when it comes to a coach or a GM or, or any of that, or a power assistant coach or power play, or should we trade for this guy? Should we trade for that guy? You're always going to be, you're always going to kind of defer to what you mentioned to try and make yourself look good. So, um, you know, I was a big Michelle Terrian fan. I still am. He made me a big reason why I'm where I'm at today. And I definitely took it uh, a little bit personally. I'm, I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. I, I really am. Because not a lot of people would say that. That's I, I think that's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, you move on from Michelle. Claude Julian comes in. And, 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 you know, we talked about, again, I feel like you never had that bona fide number one center. What was it like, I guess, you know, them last few years there? And everything leading up to that trade. So, Julian's there, he comes in, he got, you know, we know the defensive system he likes to play and uh, he, he's a stickler for that. How, how did, how did it affect you with Michelle gone, now Claude Julian there? What's going on with you? Oof, I, you know, I don't quite remember every detail about all the feelings I was having, but I do know that when things started to slide, I was... Uh, kind of upset about some of the decisions. Um, uh, one thing was uh, Davey Derriday used to always, we used to always talk about it. And we said, we said the day that Andre Markov left the halves is the day that they'll start to slide. Um, turns out Davey was spot on because I think Andre Markov, I know Andre Markov till this day is the smartest player I've ever played with. I mean, I could credit six goals easily a year where he would just find me on the on the back uh, dot for a one timer back side, he, yeah. And and I know he was Marky was getting old, and Marky's skating wasn't the same. But Marky was a true pro in an old school sense, where you know if you're a young guy and and you weren't in the gym before him, he's gonna let you know. <laughs> and uh, that old Russian mentality was just. <laughs> 
off the ice, on the ice was that kind of accountability as an organization that I don't think that they really appreciated. Um, so we really missed Marky that year. We really missed Radzu that year. Radulov yep. won. I oh. had so much success with him. Um, yeah, we should have. I thought we should have kept him. He was just a player that I truly enjoyed playing with. We really liked playing together. And then uh, I think there was a lot of injuries. Everything just started to spiral and uh, kind of got out of control. And and uh, at one point, you know, me and Burge had talked. Maybe we should uh, talk about resigning early and kind of or talk about it at least. And and then uh, our relationship kind of went uh, south from there. And I thought it was inevitable uh, about. Uh, you know, my time there was going to be up at the deadline. I didn't get traded. And then like two games after that, I ended up uh, spraining my MCL. And it's just the way things work, right? When you're always so down. I remember and, that. Yeah. You're always kind of thinking, where am I going? What's going to happen? And then you get injured and yeah, the rest was history. I don't think uh, after that season, I ever really went, I don't think I ever went back to the rink after that. I'd be around Montreal kind of just waiting for my time to expire Trade took a lot longer than uh, than we anticipated, but uh, I think a lot of it was going to be focused on signing an extension, and and it, then it did happen. And you know, no hard feelings. I was I was ready to move on. Well, if we can go back because I and you brought it up um, uh, about uh, like with Bergie, and I I got to get to this because we, you know I had you on my show in Montreal at the time, and we talked and. You said you never asked to be traded. And there's some, there need, should be some clarity, I think, because a lot of people still in Montreal think, oh, you asked to be traded because th- you didn't get that center iceman. Now I look back and I, I look at Bergie making the trade, Sergei Sheffield drew in, drew in, come in, they tried him at center. That wasn't fucking working. It ain't working. It will never work. So he comes in, and that's the center that he was kind of giving you to work with. Uh, the word was that Max has to be traded because he wanted a better center iceman to play with. And I don't blame you. After four 60 plus point seasons, you would have think he might have done that for you. Or even after two of them. And it never happened. Now, did you ever ask to be traded? No, not officially. I think what happened, and and there is a lot of confusion. I think a lot of it's based on the fact that I switched agents during that time. But we had spoken about uh, potentially doing an extension, and this is you know what I was I was told. So it wasn't you know one on one speaking, but we yeah. thought maybe uh, we could work on doing an extension, and and then things started to go south, and it was like okay, who was we- the agent at the time? You went from. I can't answer it. Oh, I went from, yeah, Pat Brisson to Alan Walsh. But before that, you were with someone else. You went to Pat Brisson, who was good friends with Bergie. Yeah. Like their best buddies. Yeah. And he's your agent now. Yeah. Did you ever get into the contract talks? No. And, no, no. Oh, so not, you didn't? No, not that I, if it did, it wasn't very far. And, and I kept telling them that I wanted to resign. And it was like, uh, and I was under the impression, once again, when everything's through agents, you don't know what's exactly completely clear or not. But I was under the impression early in the year that they would want to resign me. And then uh, when they were saying they weren't, it's like, OK, if you're not going to resign me, you know what I you know what I am. I'm the captain of the team. I've been here for this amount of time. And you were talking about resigning me. Like, what would you be worried about here? And And we kind of just both I think they realized my time was up. I realized my time was up. And then it just becomes a okay, where am I going to go? Because I don't have trade protection, right? So you have to do whatever you can to go to the best fit possible. And it was a contract year. So listen, am I just going to let them, you know, put me on the last place team and say, all right, pack your bags, see you later. You know, you'll probably have 30 points this year on a last place team and (laughs) and then you get absolutely screwed. So no, you got to go into defense mode. And this is the business side. And, you know, I see both sides of it, but it's like, okay, we got to try and go to this team. We got to try and block that team. You have no trade protection. Would this team want to sign you? And and that's where all the confusion of, you know, do you want to get traded? Well, no, I want to sign a deal, but you're most likely going to trade me. So I got to try and, you know, make sure that it ends up in a good situation. And and uh, so you had no say in the, in the Vegas thing, really? Or no, I mean, no, no I, I had ultimately it was a I signed an extension upon it. Right. Yeah. So and that was good for Montreal as well. I think I think I could be wrong here, but I think 
I know that they want to trade me somewhere where I would sign an extension so that they would get more yeah. back. I don't know if that was, can't even remember if that was completely talked about or not. But at the end of the day, that's, you know, how both teams kind of get the most out of the player and the deal. And that kind of blocks me from, from without any trade protection, going to, you know, a bottom feeder team in the league where yeah. I would. Well, both teams did. Which, it didn't was, LA it was, try to trade for you too? Who? Didn't you, LA? Yeah, that, LA yeah exactly. That was based upon a uh, an extension that we couldn't come to an agreement on. And then we had to kind of, and that was, I think that might've been at the draft or something. And so, uh, oh, and, yeah. and so when the, that eight, happens. The 2018 entry draft. That was, yeah. Yep. So when that happens, you're kind of sitting there like, okay, like how, how am I going to go? Everyone in the world knows this. It was all over the media. Like, how am I going to go back in the locker room? I'm, for sure not going to have the C anymore, right? Like, I'm going to get just absolutely destroyed. I Like, you just cannot be in the locker room, I feel, in Montreal after something like that. And so then you're really trying to push to to make something happen. But at the end of the day, you're so hopeless because you're so helpless because you there's nothing you can do, right? Like, someone has to want you and, and the money has to add up and work. And, and I'm thankful for how it all played out. You know, Montreal got a... A great return. Uh, I yeah, feel like, did. yeah, I feel like my time in in Montreal was a su- success. My time in Vegas was a success, and uh, I think Montreal is obviously happy with the trade as well. Speaking of Vegas, like, what were your initial thoughts right away? I mean, how that that had to be? Were you relieved, and also kind of like, were I mean, what's it like to play in Vegas? It was, yeah, I was at the point. I'm like, okay, I have to sign this deal. There's a good deal for myself, and my family. There's no state tax, or you know, a team that's coming off. <laughs> going to the Stanley cup final. And I'm like, Oh man, maybe I won't bring the family. Like what's like living in Vegas. Like, and then I came out here and I'm like, Oh, we don't we ever go to the strip. It's a really nice place to live. The suburbs are great. The schools are great. So right away I was, I was just so happy that it was completely different than anyone could ever imagine. And uh, yeah, I mean, I knew that the team was going to be good, but also, you know, the first, their first year was, you know, it was obviously the best story ever, but it, it was an anomaly, right? So they wanted to try and bring in some guys to, to help that situation. And, and they signed a couple guys traded for a few and, and, uh, you know, I had a great four years here last year as a team, we underachieved big time. And, uh, uh, I learned a lot while I played here. Maxi, I got to go back before we go to, uh, Vegas and, and, and it's good, but we, I didn't even touch on this. And I remember Jerry and I, uh, met you and went for dinner one night and it was, um, before you got, the Chara hit. You remember? Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. We went for dinner. Yeah. And um, we were talking, and 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 you scored that goal, and you remember you rabbit yeah. punch Chara, yeah. and he was pissed. He was yeah. pissed. Yeah. And we talked that night, and you said, you know, we talked about well, if if it happens, what should I do? And I said, listen, first of all, I wouldn't fight him, but I keep my stick up, and if you yeah. have to fight him, hang on fucking tight. Yeah. Right. And then, sure enough, that night comes, and uh, fuck, I'll never um, forget it, and I'm sure you won't either, but, it, like, Christ, w- what was that like? You know, here you are, and fucking Boston, Montreal, they hate each other, I get it. Uh, you know, and then you're getting that puck in the neutral zone, you're coming with speed, and boy, you know, usually defensemen back off a little bit and respect that speed. But boy, he, he said, I'm coming. I'm just fucking, this is all or nothing. And man, yeah. the, the hit you took and then to lay there on the ice, what was going through your mind and what were you thinking at the time um, that happened when you were laying I'm, there on the ice? Yeah, I mean, as both you guys know, that that the league and the sport was just a, it was a different time then. Like we, I think the game before that, we had a goalie fight and like three line brawls. And so, once again, you know, me being naive is like, okay, I think I fought like, I forget, McQuaid or something. Someone, they were coming after me. But like I said, it was a couple line brawls. They were a much tougher team than us. And I just yeah. figured, you know, like I was so, I was really so dumb. I was like, all right, if I get my head bashed in, I get it bashed in. But I mean, if you look at the time and the clock on, uh, on that play uh, where, you know, he pushes my head into the, into the glass. Like it's just a nothing play. It's, it's me being young and stupid. Like, Oh, let me try and win this race at the end of a period that has no relevance on the game at all. 
And, uh, you know, obviously he throws my head into the turnbuckle and, and I don't remember the rest. I remember waking up at the hospital, but, uh, really you live and you learn, right? It's like, okay, uh, yeah. hockey's not like that anymore, but it's like, okay, this is useless play. I know that that's Chara over there on the right point. No, I'm not going to go for this puck, but, but <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's probably one of those cases where you guys have probably been there before where it's like, coach is like, Oh, you're bailing out on this puck. And it's like, no, well, yeah. shut up. Well, yeah. Why don't you have Chara throw your head into the friggin' glass like that? Like you, you just learn to be smart. And, and I definitely wasn't, I was reckless with my body when I was, you know, in junior in college. Yeah. And, and, you know, I would take a lot of hits, but there's just some hits you don't have to take. And uh, I learned quickly that that was but a hit that I didn't have to take. You evolved and you matured. It's like, come on. I, and I, I watched it. I watched it. You know, you were doing the thing with the fucking stick after you <laughs> scored and all that. Right. And that's yeah. young and stupid. Yeah. And, you know, fuck, I, I know. I know. And, yeah. and you changed that, though. Yeah. You didn't. You changed that to your credit. And. It's, it's about maturing in the game, and you don't know. You are naive in a lot of ways. People don't, people don't know how difficult it is, for one, and, and you got to find your way, and you're finding your way in front of fucking 20,000 people every night. It's not the easiest thing. Right, yeah. and, and in today's world, you just want to, you know, cancel these kids off of one thing that they do. But like you said, we, you make a mistake here and there. You learn. I'm a completely different person than I was when I was, you know, when I no pushed question. Chara, I didn't even know it was him. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was just yeah. so fired up for a goal. And, and at the end of the day, yeah. it was social media and media. I remember there was like articles like, oh, how could he do that? Or something like it was the worst thing in the world. I'm like, what, pushing him after there's like yeah. five line brawls the game before? Like, yeah, it was stupid. Like yeah. it's a stupid. But like you said, I wouldn't do that now. And, and that's the world we live in. It's like. People do change, and and what I know now at 33 years old is, I think I was 20 years old or 21 years old when that happened. Like you yeah. guys know, it's you're a completely di different person at this uh, stage of your life. How did you? Uh, did that take a while to like kind of let go? Did you when you kind of got back playing after that? Were you like hesitant a little bit? I mean, what did that do mentally to you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we talk about being dumb and naive. That was probably the <laughs> dumbest and most naive. I I ever was. I was like, are you kidding me? I'm going to come back and be better. Like that was a great goal. That was a great shot. What do you guys mean? <laughs> what do you mean? My <laughs> career is going to be different. And, and the one thing though, is I always put in the work, like that was the end of the season. Um, I, that was the end of my season. I didn't play in the playoffs. We ended up losing, I think the Boston game seven. And I would have come back in the next series in hindsight, like probably thank God that we lost because I, I probably wasn't ready to come back. And I probably would have had a little bit of uh hesitation in my game but I had that whole summer and I work like a dog like I still have the before and after pictures from that summer and people are like oh my god like what did you do and I'm like I just I worked like I all day all day I didn't have you know I didn't have kids then I just wake up go to the gym skate go back to the gym I was just it was I was an animal and but still in my mind I was like are you kidding me I'm gonna score 30 every year for the rest of my career and and like I keep saying, like it's so dumb and naive of me, but it's also like why I, why I'm am where I'm at right now. And and I look at young kids' careers, and they're probably reading all this stuff. And great skill players, more skilled than I've ever been, and 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 they never make it. And I wonder how much of that is them being like doubting themselves and and reading how, you know, oh after this mistake you're never going to make it, and and kind of having that negative mindset and. And I kind of look at dumb and naive as a, as a positive uh, for why I've made it and, and why a lot of kids probably do make it now. Uh, you, well, you were like a racehorse that just you, you, you race, you eat, you shit, yeah. go to sleep, get up and do it again. <laughs> and, and <laughs> you, you know, um, and I think, and, and you're right about that naivete. Um, and I think about it and here you are 33 years old now. And I, Remember, you come in, you're just a kid. Time fucking flies. And I say that because I remember Larry Robinson when I was a kid. I was like 21. And it was after practice one day, and I, and I was laughing, joking in the locker room. And now Larry's 28, and I'm looking at him like he's a fucking old man. Yeah. That's, this is the craziness of it. This guy's old. He's been around a yeah. while. And, and I'm sitting there laughing and joking. He looks at me. He, says, uh, he said, hey, Knuckles. 
And I said, what? He says, you're having fun, aren't you? I said, yeah, I'm, it's a blast. I mean, I can't believe I'm here. And he says, well, enjoy it because it's going to go like that. And yeah. I'm like, you know, okay. But you don't want to hear that when you're fucking 20. Yeah. But now where you are at 33, did it go like that? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, it's not over yet, but no. I mean, you are, you're on the other side of it. I know. You just have no time to, like, I, I feel guilty if I ever worry about anything. Like, I get traded and it's like, oh, now I got to worry about a house and schools for the kids and youth hockey. And then I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, you don't t- spend any time worrying. You're just wasting time of, like, like you said, this, like, we only have so much of this time. I just want to enjoy every second of it. So, I mean, I, I was in that mindset for maybe a couple hours and then I snapped out of it because it's like, yeah, it goes by so quickly. And, and I'm, I'm fortunate. Like I, I want to see other places. I want to play for, for different teams. And, and as long as you're contending, right. And you want to be one of yeah. the teams that can, that can hopefully. Well, win. you're going somewhere. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're not going to the fucking Kraken, baby. <laughs> you're going to the Canes. Yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm really excited. Yeah. And and then now, I mean, I always say this. I joke around with friends. You know, some guys have three girls or four girls. And you have – it takes a man to make a man. You have four boys. I mean, yeah. you know, if you're ever going to have a, a daughter for poor Katia, and you do, yeah. which is awesome. you got five kids now. And we just uh, got to say hi when you were in Montreal and see little um, uh, Max and Lorenzo um, playing hockey. Now – and we had talked about it, and this is crazy. We're talking about it, and you say, what do you think? you think I move back east for the hockey when I'm retired, blah, blah, blah? And here you are getting traded to Carolina. Yeah. So you will be back east now. So that would be great for the boys and your daughter. Yeah. But great for you, too, in the sense that you are going to a contender, uh, playing for Brindamore. you got one year left on your contract. This is a big year for you. Now, um, are you... You're going to move down there. Just say they sign you next year, or maybe they don't. Um, would you be willing to pick up and go somewhere else? Or do you want to? What's the deal with that? I know you want to do yeah. well there, and I know you will do well there. What I'm saying is, uh, what if they don't offer you that deal you want? Uh, would you go somewhere else? Yeah, well, the, the problem is, is I'm not dumb and naive anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> I see. I That's see not the, a problem. Yeah. It's not a problem. I see the reality of, yeah, having five kids and, and you know, we're going to a rental home. And, and uh, you know, the when my name kind of got out there in the trade rumors, I'm like, okay, well, it would suck to go to a bottom feeder and they get traded at the deadline. That was kind of my biggest worry, especially with the kids and whatnot. So, no, I, you know, I, I'm open-minded to anything. I being like versatile and, 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 you know, uh, having the kids be able to go different places and see different places for me is a blessing. That's the way I look at it. Um, I know I'm going into a really good situation. I'm going to a great team with a great coach, great management. I know that, uh, we have a chance to win this year. And if I really like it, hopefully we can, uh, stay there. And, and if, if not, I, I don't see that happening with me not liking it, but, uh, you know, life goes on and, and that's the mentality I have now. And I've, uh, created a, or I've extended my career to a point where I'm really happy with where I'm at, but I know that I have so much more, uh, gas in the tank and I haven't looked that far ahead. I've kind of just been worrying Good. about right now and seeing where that's at. And, and I just keep hearing from people, you know, I think the true test is, you know, when you see how many people retire in the city that they played without any ties to it previously, you kind of know you're going to a good place and, and the amount of retired players that live in Carolina uh, says a lot about, you know, the team and the culture and the city and, and the fans. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be a part of that. That's What's awesome. the ages of your kids? I have eight down. So eight. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Are you done? Are you yeah, done? I, I mean, I, I, wanna, I don't want to get you in trouble, but are you done? My, my wife's done. I would have 20 kids. <laughs> <laughs> Once you're outnumbered, you're screwed, anyways. But yeah, <laughs> it's uh, they, at this point they they play with amongst each other, and and that's you know I'm always there watching it, but I, I don't have to do all the uh, kind of babysitting anymore because they just beat each other up, and and I just I'm the referee basically. Um, I I gotta ask you to go back. I know we got to the Carolina piece, and you haven't got to get there yet, but uh, the um. Vegas 
experience. Awesome, obviously. How much did it suck to lose to the Habs in the playoffs? Oh. Because I, you know, I, I, I'm thinking, honestly, I didn't give a fuck about the rest of the Vegas, but I'm thinking you because you played with the Habs. And, and here right. you are, and they come in, they fucking, they, they shock everybody by doing what they yeah. did. And, of course, Price played out his ass, like unbelievable. Yeah. And, and how much did that suck for you? The worst part is everyone always want to like through the whole thing. Everyone always want to talk to me about it. It's like, yeah, everyone's like, oh, they wouldn't have even made the playoffs if they weren't in that division. I'm like, okay, yeah. guys, relax. And then it's like, oh, if if uh, Toronto didn't do this or that, then they would have never. And they just kept going with it. So I'm like, guys, Galchenyuk like, didn't give the puck yeah. away. <laughs> I'm like, guys, like price is like goaltending matters, and price is pretty good. Like, so, like stop sending me this stuff. People are texting me like. There's no way they're gonna win this next round. I'm like, okay, like relax. And then we get there, and I'm like, <laughs> oh god, like it, it was, you know, everyone. I, I mean, I had to turn off my phone during that playoff series. And even when we got there, people were like, there's no chance they're gonna beat you guys. And then after, you know, like the first game, it's like, oh, we're gonna sweep these guys. And thinking about like, you know, what you're gonna <laughs> do with your time off to get ready for the finals. And then you know they win a couple, and it's like. And then, you know, we, we kind of find our game, but then, you know, they get a, a that bounce uh, at the end of the game in Montreal, and you're just like, oh, man, do they start to believe over there? And you know how playoffs are. It's like yeah, it's like a game of poker. It's like, do they believe over there or do they not? And you can kind of see <laughs> them start to believe, and you're just like, oh, man, we got to buckle up. Like, this team is, like, rallying right now. They're they're you know, they're, they're tough to play against in front of their net. Their goaltender is playing hot right now. And, and a couple of their guys are feeling it. And then you start to worry. And then at the end, you're just like, Oh God, how did I let that happen? And, and the worst was we were stuck in the rink after the, after we lost because of all like the, whatever riots or whatever you want to call it, the celebrating. Yeah. Then we're on the bus for like 30 minutes back to the, back to the Ritz, which is like a two minute drive. And we just see people like, just chirping us all over. And, you know, I saw people like lighting garbage cans on fire. And I just like, at one point, I think I shed a tear or two. <laughs> I was like, I cannot wow. believe this happened. Like, I know, oh my that, God, I was so upset. One. Yeah. And so like, I locked myself in the room that night and I just, I didn't sleep a second for like a couple nights. And then as you, as we keep talking about life goes on, come home to your family, see the kids, you yeah. know, they still love you. And you're just like, you know, I gave it my all. That's the one thing I could say about that series is it's not easy to, I know it wasn't full of fans, but to get booed every time you touch the puck and to have people. Yeah. Uh, that sucks. Yeah. It it, sucks. You, it's, Fuck, they boo me every time I touch the puck, which yeah. is only once. <laughs> yeah. It, um, it really wasn't easy, but I was proud of the effort I gave. And, I, I, and, and at the same time, you know, a lot of those guys, I wasn't happy that they beat us, but I was happy that they got a shot at it. How about Flower, though? Like he, he, they, they really kind of fucking screwed him over, didn't he, Mark Andre Fleury? I mean, listen, I made a mistake. It was a big mistake, but holy shit! Like, why don't you give the bounce back? The kid could bounce back. Did you agree with that move? Looking back, do you think it should have come back with him? You know, I don't, I, I honestly, I don't remember what I felt in the moment. And so I can't, yeah. I, in hindsight, I could say, yeah, you should have played. But in the moment, I, I genuinely don't remember because like I said, I was so caught up in, in all that stuff. But I will say that if anyone in the world can overcome something like that, it's Flower. He Him. is like yeah. the ultimate <laughs> yeah. competitor. Yeah, I mean, the guy can block out anything. Yeah, like you, like you, you never played with a goaltender that, you know, you go bar down on him in practice and he like is laughing and he just is chirping you like, I'm going to get you next time. So <laughs> if there's any guy in the world that could, could bounce back from, you know, something like that, it, it'd be flower. Yeah, that was tough the way they dealt with that one. But that's the, that's the game, right? That's the sport, the business side, everything. Um, that was tough to watch. But um uh, what the hell else? I, I got a couple of things. Chris? Uh, oh, fuck man. off, fuck off. Sorry, we Max. don't want you on. No, Max, this no. is, yeah. Get out of <laughs> here, is, will you? This is the painful part. Don't screw the whole thing up. This is the painful part. This is very, Max, very the, uh, this is Barry. We, we love Barry, and Barry uh, is, is awesome. So he, he always loves to come on and ask a few. Because Tim and I don't want to say, like, 
But, yeah, he's gonna ask the question. Like, what like type someone, of curve? Someone's gonna you... ask you at a bar while you're yeah. like, like, dude. <laughs> what lie do you use, and what yeah. curve is it? You know, what's it like um, to play against Patrick Kane? <laughs> and Max, um, Barry's son Dylan played for the Pens a bit, and okay. uh, Dylan Reese. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. You know Dylan. Yeah. T- Team USC played with the USA a little bit too. So anyway, Listen. so Listen. Barry, fire away, Barry. Well, Max, you were refreshingly honest. Seriously, it's yeah. been great listening to you. Been awesome. And I, you, when you went to Vegas. What was it like so starkly different in pressure than it was in Montreal? I mean, did it did it feel like almost a total relief? I mean, I was wondering because it's her first, you know, right at the beginning and they're, and you know, if you get pressure there. No one knows who the fuck you are. Yeah, it's this is going to sound my answer to this. And I've been thinking about it a lot lately. And I and I there are good sides to everything. So when I first got there, I was almost like it was kind of weird that there was no accountability and I'm not talking about like within the team, I'm talking about like, like everywhere. You just couldn't like, you couldn't feel pressure coming off of anyone else from the coach, from the management. Like, I mean, I would play, I had an awful game and I come in and everyone's saying hi to me and I'm like, okay, this is a little (laughs) weird. Like normally like we walk by each other and like stare at the carpet and then at the same time, like I, if, even if you wanted to find out what the media was saying about you, I don't even know how you would even go about that because it's like, I don't even know if the, where the media would be on Twitter. I don't even know what to search or anything like that. So <laughs> I, there was a relief when I got there, but then I found myself being like, okay, I got to kind of like reel this thing in and, and, and hold myself to a higher standard and hold Kick myself. Your own more, ass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which I had always done my whole life. But maybe I got away from that a little bit when I had everybody else kind of holding me accountable. So, in fact, I even mentioned that at the end of the year. I'm like, and, and I didn't say it specifically, but I'm like, I, I'm not saying I, I wanted to, this to be like playing back in Montreal, but I even told her, I'm like, you got to, you know, no one's really holding us accountable. If we have a bad year like this, like the city would be like be half on fire in Montreal and here we are we're <laughs> showing up to the rink and it's 80 degrees and it's sunny and we're getting our car wash and getting our organic food and our go play you know, golf yeah, yeah go play, play golf and I was kind of like <laughs> no we got to kind of police this thing a little bit better amongst each other because like it, I don't want to say it's a country club but uh, like you have no one from the outside holding you accountable so I never thought in a million years that I'd be feeling this way but but at the end of the day, I, I kind of look at, OK, what can I have done better this year? And, and that was almost like I'm not saying I'm going to, you know, be like uh, a journalist that's going to go rip a player. But at the same time, a lot of these guys haven't played somewhere else, so they don't know really what it's like. And and I felt myself personally, uh, it always gets the best out of you when you have either a coach or somebody or my parents, uh, not with hockey, but with other stuff, like when they're demanding and hold you accountable and. And I found myself almost missing that a tiny bit when things went wrong this year. And I know it sounds crazy, and yeah, no, <laughs> people I, might I jump know what on you're me. Saying. Yeah, so I, I, I know you. Yeah, I and it's just a part of the sure. evolution of, uh, as Chris mentioned before, of like being a different person and growing up. And and uh, yeah, I find myself, you know, kind of wanting that accountability now. But when I first got traded, definitely not. I I, I had to kind of take a step back and, and reel myself in when it came to that. Well, I just have a couple more questions and I promise that'll be it. You know, I have yeah, to ask only my, get with it, get with it. Come on, <laughs> fuck, get with it. <laughs> Dude, I don't, I don't, I don't know what kind of relationship you have with your parents or anything, but you know, I hear hockey players so much call their fathers after every game and you're, would you say 34 years old now? Yeah. Turning 34. Do you, yeah. Do you call anybody after every game? Now that you have a no. wife and four kids or five kids, I <laughs> not call specifically, but my parents watch every game and I know how hard it is for them to watch because they always want, you know, the best for me. But uh, at the end of the day, like, um, you know, Chris knows my, my dad, my parents, like, yeah, uh, I just know how much my dad especially went through uh, to get me to where I'm at. Yeah. So like every time he mentions hockey, I know he gets pretty emotional about it because you know, one season we mentioned the youth hockey in Connecticut. I mean, I was playing with, I had to play with 89s because it was a back half birthday and it wasn't a great year. He would drive me to Marlboro for practice uh, twice a week. That's two and a half hours each way. Crazy. Twice wow. a week. And, and 
if I, I now that I have kids of my own, I just couldn't even imagine doing that. So. I, well, no, you just yeah, fucking no fly chance. to Montreal and Toronto. <laughs> yeah. no, I saw Max in Montreal, right? Yeah. No, really. I, I, you know, Max is in town. We we end up. Yeah. I go and see the little buggers play, right? Yeah. Um, did I see little Max play? Or you was saw it Max. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Max. Max right. Yeah. So, you know, Max get him in a tournament so they can play the weekend before he's in Toronto, yeah. and it's great to have the means to do that. But, you know, I'm watching little Max, and you figure eight year old kid. He just turned eight. I'm watching him out on the ice, and, and you know, a lot of kids, they chase the fucking puck. They chase, just go after the puck. Well, the defenseman on the other team got the puck, and he goes behind the net, and little Max is going after him, and the kid goes behind the net. He don't, most kids chase behind the net. He came across in front, angled the fucking guy off, just like it, you know, like a hockey sense. When yeah. you have hockey sense, you do those things. I was shocked. Not, yeah. not shocked, but just surprised for a young kid to do that, so... You certainly got the genes, and um, yeah, it was awesome to see. Uh, you, you, that fucking crazy. See, it, all of a sudden, you're a, you're a dad, five kids, and you're yeah. 33. Well, that's yeah. funny yeah. though. Yeah. That's yeah. funny what he said though, because I, my dad and my parents did everything. You know, they built the rinks in the yard. They drove me everywhere, and I'm like trying to pay the mailman to take my kid to the practice <laughs> so I could golf, so I could golf another nine holes. You know, but. <laughs> It's amazing. No, it's awesome. Well, my dad never played hockey, but I I think yeah. he's a I honestly think he's the smartest hockey person I know. Like he the things he sees in a game and, and it's just cuz he knows my game, right? Like so yeah. whenever I need advice or something, even when I need advice on the kids, like what did you see about Enzo or what did you see about Max? It's like we me and my wife are always asking him because you know, he 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 went through that whole thing with me, so it's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, my next, my next to the last question. This is the one they probably hate. If you could steal one skill from another player in the NHL today, what skill would that be? You could just, uh, if you look McDavid around, you speed. Steal it. Yeah, McDavid okay. speed, there hands down. I mean, it, if anyone else is answering differently, is yeah, is lying you, to great you? Great question, yeah. Barry. <laughs> because <laughs> <That's yeah>. good... <laughs> he's like a video easy, game. Yeah. 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 All right, my last question, I oh, promise. I, uh, I, I know it's a little premature, but if you could write, if you were writing your first sentence of your hockey eulogy, what would it say? Stanley Cup champion in 2023. Okay. okay that's, that's awesome, Dad. Yeah. And, and that's, Max, the only thing that's missing for you. And, yeah. and um, listen, I, I think, and you just said that, a lot of great players who played the game never got that sniff. I'm telling you, if we don't win in 86, Patrick Waugh don't come along and close the mule. Like, I should have left school one year earlier. I would have had that Stanley Cup. I didn't. So if I never won in 86, here's what, what would have happened. I would have missed that Stanley Cup. And then 92, I wanted to come back and play another year. They said, no, we only want one older guy in the team. You finished. I was done. Then they win that year, 92, 93. Imagine if I never win one. I miss yeah. both. I'm like, ah, fuck. But again, doesn't diminish your career at all. But boy, it, it, it'd it be awesome. I'd love to see you fucking lift that Stanley Cup um, with um, Jesperi Kotkaniemi. <laughs> right? Uh, it'd be awesome. It'd be oh, awesome yeah. for you. They're oh, close. Yeah. I'm excited. Right? They're, they're close. Yeah, we're close. Yeah. And, um, yeah, we're yeah, listen, I want to thank you for joining me today. Awesome. Max and Tim and, and Barry and, um, uh, so, so much appreciate I do. And I want to wish you nothing but the best moving forward. You were gracious with your time. And like Barry said, upfront and honest, that's all we could ask. So thanks a lot, buddy. 